As many of you know, camping has been a really important part of my faith journey. United Church camps transformed my life. And one of my favorite camps was Silver Lake United Church Camp up near Kincardine in Ontario. And I was specifically involved in this camp during the very last week of the summer. So for the first seven weeks of the year, we would hire high school students to be counselors. And they would care for kids any, as young as five to as old as about 13. And they would come to camp and have a great time. But in the very last week, week number eight of the summer, we had kids who were high school aged come. And it wouldn't work very well to have high school aged counselors for high school aged kids. So we brought in a whole new set of volunteer staff. But we didn't stop there. We wanted to make this camp the most amazing camp that we could make it. So we brought in a whole set of program staff as well, who were volunteers. And we created these massive games and this incredible camp experience for everyone to be involved in. So for example, we would run these theme games. We would take cabins and the dining hall and our other open spaces, and we would transform them into Egypt and Paris and Brazil, and we would have, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? And we would have characters, and we would play this game for four hours, and it was epic, and it was great. Now, one of the things that we would also try to do is we try to make meal times really special too. So one year we had this, we'd seen on YouTube, will it microwave? And so you take a microwave and it's a very simple principle. You just choose random things that you're gonna put in a microwave and see what happens. So, you know, you could put an egg in the microwave, but that's only so exciting. Then you take a Barbie doll and you wrap it in tin foil and you put it in the microwave <laughs> and you get a whole different, different thing happening, right? So it was pretty exciting, right? So then, so we did will it microwave one year and then we did will it blend. So you take random things and you put them in a blender and you see if it'll blend. So the third year, we needed something else to do. So we had an idea. We said, will it drop? And our dining hall had windows uh, kind of like this, but completely covering the side of our dining hall, about waist high, that you could see out to the lake. And our roof was about 15 feet tall. And so we decided we were just going to throw things off the roof during, during the meals. And so we like built it up into this big thing and there would be this moment where for like a split second you would see something fall off the roof. So we started with a toilet, an old toilet <laughs> bro broke down. And of course from there you only have to get bigger and better, right? So then the, the, the day after that we did a washing machine. All these things are broken, like we're not buying a new washing machine and throwing it off the roof. They're just, it's camp, you've got all sorts of stuff. And then the day after that, we threw an old canoe that we had kicking around off the roof. And then, like, where do you go? Like, you can't really throw a car off a roof. That sounds pretty dangerous. How would you even get it up there? So in our, in our bright minds, we decided we were going to throw people off the roof. <laughs> so we went to the local high school, and we got all their high jump mats. And we uh, set them out. and. Uh, I don't know, I was feeling like a little adventurous, so I was like, I'll jump first. So I'm standing on the edge here, and I'm looking down, and I think, this is not a good idea. <laughs> but the parts of my brain had not yet connected. So, so I swung my legs out and just fell down, and I had a lovely landing. I thought, this is great. The kids are going to love this. So then I went up, and I jumped again, and it was fine. And then we had some of our volunteer program staff. And some of these kids were actually quite young. And so they started jumping off. But rather than swinging their feet out and landing softly like a full body land, they were jumping like feet first right into these mats. And it wasn't good. So one, one of these kids jumped off. And she landed. And she was in immediate pain. So we took the mats out. And we put her on a body board. And she spent three months in bed rest after breaking a vertebrae in her spine. Now, if you go into the Silver Lake rule book now, 
you'll, you'll see a rule. And the rule says, no unauthorized people on the roof. <laughs> now, for me, this is very real. I know exactly why that rule is in place. And, and many of you probably have done similar things, and now there's a sign posted somewhere. Do not jump off this bridge, or do not go up this ladder, or something like that. And, and, and the, the rule is in place for a reason. Now, that's a, a somewhat silly example. It's actually qu quite embarrassing to talk about it now, because somebody got very hurt off of it. But we have this thing with rules. We take the spirit of the rule, and we manipulate it, and all of a sudden, the law that comes out on the other side, the rule that comes out on the other side, is not necessarily reflective of the original intent. Let me give you a couple of examples. In the Old Testament, there's this idea around tithing. That when you harvest your fields, most people were agriculturalists of some kind. You harvest your field, you take 10% of whatever you have and you bring it to the temple. Now you don't bring it to the temple because you have to bring it to the temple. You bring it to the temple as a way of saying, these potatoes or these carrots or these chickens, I, I helped care for them but really they grow and they are nurtured by all sorts of forces way beyond my control. And so when I give this 10%, it's not, it's not a rule, it's not a commandment, it's, it's an offering. It's, it's a way of saying thank you for the gift. But it turned into give 10% or else. And, and there are some churches today that still require you to give 10%. If you don't, you actually can't vote at their meetings. Or there's the law of Sabbath, right? There's this idea, you should take one day off a week. Not just for you, any servants you have, any animals you have, everyone gets a rest. Now the idea behind this is that, well, it's good to rest. It's good to remember that our productivity as human beings does not require us to constantly be producing and constantly working. Just take a day to rest. But after a while, that rule gets corrupted. It turns into go to church and no dancing on Sundays and don't go swimming on Sundays and all these kind of commandments that come out of this rule, which has this, it has a great spirit behind it, but the actual rule itself gets twisted and manipulated. Now, I really don't know the rule and why the rule that Jesus is confronted with, why it's there. There's this rule in the, in the Old Testament, in the first five books, where if a woman uh, marries a man, and they don't have children together, and the man dies, then she's supposed to marry the brother, the next in line, until they have kids. Well, that ain't going to happen. I don't know if it ever really happened very much. But there was this rule, and, and I honestly don't know the spirit behind it. But there's this rule, and, and the Sadducees are the ones who, who take up the cause of this rule. Now, often... We see Pharisees in the story, but today specifically mentions a different group, a different denomination, a different religious sect called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, it says in the story, don't believe in resurrection of any kind. They hold true to the five books of the Bible that it starts with called the Pentateuch. So there's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But for most Jews, there's those five books, plus there's Kings and Chronicles and Judges and Psalms and Isaiah, all the prophets. But for the Sadducees, there's just these five books, and these books are full of rules, maybe with good intent, but often which are distorted and twisted. And they come to Jesus. Jesus is in the temple in Jerusalem in this part of Luke, and they come, and it, it's like a duel. It's like a sparring match. And in fact, this is maybe a good analogy for many of the encounters Jesus has with teachers of the law. They come and, and they want that gotcha moment. That moment where they confront Jesus with a question that he's unable to answer and they prove 
their legal and moral superiority. In many cases, that's, that's the tension. So they come with Jesus and they have this question. They've got the question of all questions. They lay out a scenario. There's a woman, she marries a man and he dies. They have no children. So she, according to the law, she's supposed to marry the next one in line. And there are seven brothers and she marries all seven. Like, well, I can't imagine anything worse than that. And at the end of the story, she dies. And I don't blame her. <laughs> like, <laughs> like <laughs> So, uh, so, 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 so this is the scenario, right? This, what an interesting scenario. And, and so they say, okay, so Jesus, you're talking about a resurrection of some kind. What exactly do you mean by that? Because if there's a resurrection, imagine there's seven brothers and one woman and, and she's kind of confused. Like she's married all of them, but there's no kid. She, she the wife of the first one because she married him first or the last one or all of them and you can you can see why the sadducees thought that this was such a rich question like how could jesus possibly answer this question but jesus is an outside the box thinker is he not so he takes a look at the question and he recognizes exactly what's going on there's a difference between the rule book and the spirit of the law. And there's a difference between uh, what the focus is. The focus of the Sadducees is that in God's world, everything is just going to come back in flesh and bones exactly the way everything sees that the way we see it now. But the realm that God is that Jesus is talking about here is totally different. Jesus says, God is a God of the living, not of the dead. You're so worried about all the laws, you totally forget that God is dealing in completely different terms than what you're dealing with. Ask the kids what they were worried about today. Like, if they were worried about death. But we worry about all things. We worry about death. We worry about finances. Uh, we worried about our jobs, our retirements. Fair enough. I can see reasons behind those things. But in God's realm, those things just seem so small and insignificant in comparison. When we speak about God here at Shemanus United Church, when we speak about God in the community, are we speaking about a God who is a God of the living or a God of the harsh rule book? Are we speaking about God who has this amazing ability to take anything and transform it into something beautiful and good? I hope we are. May it be so.